Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, iPhone for Clinical Communication at Parkview. I'm joined today by a very special guest, Steve Shirley, CIO at Parkview Medical Center in Pueblo, Colorado. And of course, I'm your host, Adam Mahmood, Industry Lead of Healthcare here at Champ. Today is part two in a three-part series of different healthcare mobility use cases that Jamf and Apple focus on. A brief look at our agenda. We'll start with just a quick overview of Jamf in the healthcare space. Quickly dig into iOS devices for care teams around clinical communication and spend most of our time in a discussion with Steve about the journey they've had at Parkview to reach mobile maturity. We'll of course leave some time for question and answers at the end. And of course, please direct that through the GoToWebinar system you're logged into. As I mentioned, this is part of a series we're putting on. If you hadn't heard the news, HIMSS, one of the largest healthcare IT conferences in the world, was canceled this week. Jamf had a huge plan to be present with our customers and partners to showcase the possibilities around these mobile devices. So we determined, let's bring it to you digitally so we can keep the conversation going. If you'd like to learn more, head over to jamf.it slash HIMS. Now at HIMS, we had three different events that were planned, all centered around different buckets of priorities in the healthcare space. Today, we'll be digging into this second item, clinical communication and workflow powered by iPhone. Now, to start, if you haven't heard of Jamf, we help organizations succeed with Apple. It's a mission we've been on for over 17 years. And much of that time, we've been focused on mobile device management solutions, or MDM for short, to cover the entire Apple ecosystem. Whether an organization is deploying Mac or iPhone or iPad or Apple TV, we have solutions to help. And over the last year, we've really doubled down on that Apple focus and expanded our product portfolio with new solutions around identity and security management for the Mac, three distinct MDM products, and of course, all housed by or founded, I should say, on our Jamf Nation community, over 100,000 Apple IT administrators that join in the discussion. Today, most of the discussion is talking about Jamf Pro, our flagship MDM product for the enterprise. Now, in the healthcare space, we have eight of the top 10 U.S. children's hospitals leveraging Jamf, 15 of the top 20 U.S. adult hospitals leveraging the product. Why, might you be asking? It's kind of simple. It comes back to the core benefit that Jamf can provide for both IT and end users. Here you see really a high-level summary of what Jamf Pro can do for your IT teams, deploying out the right configurations and settings, ensuring that the teams can monitor wirelessly those settings uh, from their console, regardless of where the end device is, and probably most importantly, being able to take action if devices are out of compliance and quickly uh, getting them back into a healthy state. For an end user, we want a simple, easy experience, one where they know exactly the apps and resources that they should be using and don't have the distractions of maybe default apps from the App Store that aren't appropriate for their need. And when you really put this all together with the right network of partners, allies, ecosystem partners, etc. This is where you can really unlock some unique experiences. And this partner concept is really true for any use case in any industry. And clinical communication is no exception. Now, Apple and many others who are uh, working with Apple strongly believe that iOS devices present a unique ability to consolidate down the disparate technology that caregivers use today. Gone are the days with six devices on a tool belt that may be weighting down a nurse's scrubs. And you know, what, how, you know, what could change when they're empowered with an iPhone in the palm of their hand? That's serving up all of these different functions that may be from different applications, from your EMR provider or a third party. So if this is the need and the use case, how does Jamf help? Well, it really comes down to the provisioning, the management, and again, the security of the device throughout its life cycle. So here you see the birth of this device into the environment, the way it's provisioned alongside Jamf and Apple's automation systems. The device talks through Apple Business Manager, informs Jamf Pro um, that it is enrolling for the first time, 
And here you see in just a matter of minutes that device is configured with just the apps that a user needs. Now, what apps are common here? Well, as I mentioned, there are many today. But one partner of Jamf and Apple who's doing it great is PatientSafe. And the reason we bring up PatientSafe is that it is the application that you'll hear about today in the Parkview story. And so with that, I'd love to bring Steve into the conversation and really open this up into a dialogue about the journey you've seen. So Steve, first off, thanks again. Really appreciate you joining us today. You bet. Good morning, Adam. Awesome, awesome. So do you mind giving the audience just a brief overview of Parkview's history? Um, what's been kind of precipitating some of the you know, uh, vision that you have around your caregivers' needs? Sure, Adam. Just uh, perhaps a little bit about Parkview. We are located about 100 miles south of Denver. The hospital formed in 1923, and, and we're interestingly enough, in Colorado, we're one of two independent hospitals left over 100 beds. So kind of in a unique situation. We also have a catchment area that is all of southern Colorado. So while our community has about 160,000 people, our entire catchment area, which is uh, south and east of us and west of us, clear to the state borders, is more around 450,000 people. So it's a very unique situation. Uh, we're a level two trauma center and, and certified in such things as chest pain, orthopedic stroke, and, and other things like that. And, you know, Adam, back in, gosh, 2009, our CNO, Chief Nursing Officer, had a vision to move us off of a paper medication administration record and into something automated. And, and so back in those days, the hospital took its first step into automation of some of these functions, uh, moving to a single-use device we called a carrot to help us with bedside administration. And so that really formed the beginnings of, of where we ended up today. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you know, maybe to just expand on that a bit, were there particular challenges amongst the care teams? Um, what was really, uh, again, inspiring your CNO and others to look for something new, something different? That's a great question. You know, I, when we think back to those days, we realized that that single use device was just that single use. And so it really was only available for bedside medication administration. And we had this vision of what we call a collaborative care team where we could have an opportunity, have technology, have a situation where not only the nurse, but the, the a doctor, the pharmacist, the phlebotomist, the respiratory therapist, all could somehow be involved in one tool that would allow for intra-group intra communication and the ability to take great care of these patients. And so that really caused us this vision of, of just going to this collaborative care team really caused us to start working on this whole project. Um, you know, along with that, we looked at our single use device and besides the fact that we really couldn't load other apps that we wanted to load down the road, we realized it could not be used at all for communication. And you said it very well, Adam, just a few minutes ago, we really wanted to get rid of multiple devices in the nurse's scrubs. And so we knew that on the road to success, we had to have a device that would allow us to do communications, and that's both voice and text. Got it. Got it. So once the decision had been made that this was a, a priority, how did you really go about to align the right strategy across the organization and ensure you had all the right people, process, you know, obviously more than just technology? Uh, thoughts? So we are, uh, this, this is an area I get really excited about because even though I'm a CIO, I kind of moonlight as a project manager and love that discipline. Um, we are very stringent here about the process we take as we engage in new projects. And, and the first piece of that is always process mapping. So we are a lean and six sigma hospital. And so as we begin each new project, we do things like, I call it brown paper mapping, but it's process flow mapping. We do value stream mapping. We do a lot of things to really understand what the process is we're trying to work with. The old saying I think most of us know that we certainly love here is that um, broken processes don't get fixed by new computer systems. And so we have found that tremendous success occurs when you just take some time to evaluate the process. So we make that uh, a requirement of every project. The second piece, Adam, that I think is so huge is we absolutely require multidisciplinary teams. And so, you know, back in the old days, if 
five years ago. It sounds crazy to say that, but you know, just not that long ago, IT would provide some type of a technology and then tell the clinicians, here you go, figure out how to use it and have fun with this. And really our strategy, I think like a lot of folks on the, on the line today is that if you don't bring your clinicians right by your side throughout the project, you don't stand a chance of success. And so we use multidisciplinary teams and, and this project is an example. We brought doctors and nurses and phlebotomists and pharmacists and respiratory therapists, all those people into the same room and started to look at what do we want to do to be successful with this collaborative care team? I think another piece, and, and this is one that I talk so much about, is that when you're gonna, when you're gonna go to something like this collaborative care team with a lot of communications, you've gotta absolutely make sure that your wireless infrastructure is sound. I'll mention it later, Adam, but we are a Cisco shop, have been for a long time. We actually thought we had the best Cisco situation we could have to bring this online and quickly realized that we needed an upgrade. So, you know, that's a piece of advice I give my peers is, you know, way before you get down the road on the project and, and have to come back and retrofit, better to go out and look at that wireless infrastructure to make sure that the things are copacetic. Uh, and then one of the things Parkview does, and again, this is uh, really with our with our heritage and project management is we have a pretty formal RFP process that we use or request for proposal uh, that we use when we go out to do any new project. And so in that request for proposal, the first thing we do is we sit down with the stakeholders and, and you know, most of the time that's clinicians, but we sit down and we really start to do some fact finding in terms of what feature functionality do they really need as we put together a system. And so that helps us to really create a matrix of feature functionality needs. We then create the RFP, which is not only the feature functionality piece, but we have sections on everything from legal ramifications. You know, if we were to contract with you, would you be willing to do this, this, and this? We have uh, company background information. We certainly don't want to do business with a company who has two employees and has been in business six months. And so we look at as much we, as we can, company financials and those kind of things. Uh, we have another section that is all about the install, the training, the support. How do they do each of those things? Uh, we have technology sections about, you know, what's their platform? Is it cloud-based? Is it going to be on-prem? What does that look like? Once we get all of those things completed, we send the RFP out, hopefully to four to five different companies. It sometimes varies, but um, we, we send it out to those companies for their responses to the request for proposal. When we get those back, we then have a time to evaluate the matrix uh, results. We do, by the way, Adam, uh, weight-based evaluation. So when we talk to our clinicians about the features, we say, you know, what, what's your number one most important down to your least important? And so we weight those and then evaluate the entire matrix. And that leads us to derivation of maybe the top one or two candidates that we then bring in for demonstrations and then we try to pick at least the, you know, the winner and maybe sometimes two winners we want to look at. And we actually go out to uh, hospitals around the country and look at the product in action. So that's our entire advanced selection tool. And I could tell you from a whole bunch of other projects, it's been highly successful. And our venture with Patient Safe was no different. Um, it's been probably one of the best successes the hospital's ever had. But I think it's in large part to this whole strategy that we use to you know, bring the tool in place. I love it. Wow. It's just such a robust strategy. We really appreciate you sharing it with the audience, you know, specifically your comments on the advanced selection tool uh, and how you start really isolating, I shouldn't say isolate, identifying these feature functionalities that are most important. It just aligns with, you know, things we've talked about with many of the other partners uh, who are represented on this discussion around thinking about outcomes first. What are the outcome, you know, what are our objectives from an output perspective, and how do we really start there and work backwards to the technology? Um, so I love it. Um, I'm wondering, actually, you know, even before we get to the tech, if uh, from the standpoint of your process mapping and the multidisciplinary tool, or excuse me, team, can you comment on how Parkview came to the conclusion to deploy a device to everyone instead of pools of shared devices? 
Well, that is an interesting question and one that uh, is hotly debated throughout our industry. But when we looked at incidents of repair, so to your point, Adam, in the early days, we started with Patient Safe and our iPhones back in 2011. We actually had iPods, our, our first iteration of the system. But one of the things we found with pooled uh, use of devices is that our incident of repair was way higher than we wanted it to be. And, and so what we did was two years ago, uh, really the director of our clinical informatics division of IT came forward and said, you know, um, we, we really got to get to the point where people take more ownership of these devices. And so we went through legal and our HR division and the head of nursing and, and came up with the idea that we would create a contract for nurses to take care of it, to be issued their iPhone individually and to then be responsible, um, you know, for unwarranted repairs and things like that. The, the most amazing thing happened to this date, almost two years later, I think we've had right around four devices that people had to pay for repairs on. So unbelievably, the, the incidence of repair has dropped. And, you know, we still have those cases where maybe we have a battery issue or, you know, things like that. But we really don't have any more that whole piece of the device getting dropped a lot or broken screen, some of those kind of things. So um, there's no question that that is a strategy that some hospitals want to do and others don't. But for us, it has worked extremely well. Very cool. Very cool. And we've already, of course, been hinting at it. Uh, but iPhone, of course, is that that selection that you made. And I think you had shared you started way back on iPod Touch and have really seen the evolution of that. But I love this image because I believe it kind of encapsulates the thought you you just shared of um, the clinician kind of maybe this sounds cheesy, but in a way kind of building the relationship with their dev their device, their tool. And to your point, feeling responsible for it uh, based on kind of that marriage of HR policy and and technical policy, et cetera. So really cool. Um, you know, any other comments about the way you selected the ecosystem around iPhone? And as you share, I'm going to transition to a next screen that kind of shows the end user view of the app just so the audience can get a feel for it. Well, Adam, I think this is probably one of the most important things I can talk about in our time together today. Uh, you know, one of the things we learned and, and now believe in with every system we install is that the ecosystem we build is critically important to success. What I've learned as an IT guy about physicians and nurses is that they're so bright and they're so intelligent that if they have a problem with a system they're using, they'll find a workaround. And sometimes those workarounds can be really painful. So, you know, for us, the ecosystem meant we had to have a device that was rock solid, that was some we could add a lot of different apps to, something that played well. Uh, with our systems and was very good with security and without question Apple was the choice we made. Uh, you know, I could tell you that I would I would never criticize Droid, but we have certainly had a lot more challenges bringing some of those devices into our systems here. So you know, we felt strongly Apple was the device we needed. And you're right, we started with the iPod, which I think back and just chuckle about, and, and we've gradually moved through iPhone 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and I'm getting excited to bring some tens into our fleet here, hopefully in the next year. Um, the next piece was the infrastructure. And I mentioned the wireless, uh, we call it wireless wellness here, but I mentioned that um, Cisco has been just an absolutely incredible partner. And, you know, we thought right away out of the gate, if we deploy this really cool app, which was what Patient Safe is, but we don't have a sound wireless infrastructure where folks are dropping calls or losing connectivity, we're going to really have a, a, a complete failure as opposed to a potential for an awesome success. And so that Cisco piece was really important. You and I have chuggled about this over the, over the years, but MDM to us in the early days in 2011 meant manual device management. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know what we didn't know. And so we went out there and tried to manage our first fleet, which was about 250 devices manually. So that meant every time we wanted to provision, upgrade, do anything we wanted to do, we had to go out to the nurses and actually get those devices and touch them. A hard lesson learned. And again, Adam, one of those things where to my peers, I say, don't go into it with an MDM like Jamf and, and don't start by thinking you can do it yourself. Um, today, we're up to a thousand devices. The ability to provision and to control those devices and 
you know, the, 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 the sky's the limit in what we can do with mobile device management. And we're, we're just so pleased to be Jam's customer because we just see a collaborative, um, innovative mindset happening between us. And so that's kind of cool. And then, of course, the, the app. And so we looked at, as I mentioned in the process, we looked at five companies, uh, patient safe, uh, we thought was just really out there doing innovative things. And, you know, sometimes you get software or hardware or technology companies that don't listen real well. And in these guys' case, they have spent countless hours on site here learning flows and, and looking at things that help to determine how they want to design their app and what they want to do. And so when it was all said and done, we picked patient safe. And so our ecosystem is Apple, Cisco, Jamf, and patient safe. And, and I can't even be able to tell you how successful we've been because we have such a strong group in, involved with us. Well, we really, really appreciate you sharing that, uh, Steve. Can't say thank you enough. Probably the most important topic of our discussion today is how this all matters and what types of outcomes are being driven for your teams and, of course, the, the business at large. Well, I'll tell you, Adam, this is where I get excited because at the end of the day, we exist in IT to support our clinicians. If, if you know, the saying is out there, if you don't have doctors and nurses, you don't have a hospital. And so we believe 100% in that. So as you can see on the slide, you know, the first important piece is 100% clinician adoption. And I could tell you, I was a little fearful because, you know, I thought perhaps some of our, our older nurses would not really get into this device. But I got to tell you, day one, everybody was doing this. And I really had no complaints from people who said, wow, I don't want to use this iPod, uh, at least in the early days. One of the things we also do, besides communications, voice and text, we do our medication administration uh, at the bedside. We do phlebotomy collection. We do blood bank. Uh, we do respiratory therapy. So we do a lot of different things. And one of the things that was a huge success for us was we were able to have 100% uh, successful labeling of bedside specimen collections. And so, you know, there's no such thing anymore as writing on a piece of tape, you know, who the patient is and, and sticking it to a vial. We have little printers, O'Neill printers, that our phlebotomists sit right at the bedside and print the label right as they collect the specimen. And so that's been a huge success for us. Uh, we had a fairly low medication administration error rate, but we still saw a 60% decrease once we went online with the patient safe system. So you know, I think all of us together as, as healthcare professionals make that as one of our very most high goals is we don't want to give the patients the wrong medication. So that's huge. 98% uh, medication administration accuracy. Um, the scanners that we use in, back in the early days, we used a jacket that had a scanner on it. We now use soft scan and use a native camera on the phone. Uh, we are, it's amazing. I go out and watch nurses a lot, and we have very minimal issues with scanning the, the patient's wristband and the medication barcode and things like that. Um, very, very high capture rate and quickly, and so that's hugely important. Uh, the last item you see there is 210% increase in HCAP scores. So, you know, with first dose education, that's one of those things we're all required to do. And with our patient safe system, literally, if it's the first dose of a new medication, the system will automatically prompt the nurse with information to give the patient about what is this medication? What does it do? What are its potential side effects? Why are you taking it? And so really that has helped us to have a tremendous leap in how our patients view us as far as the efforts we do to educate them. That is just tremendous. So cool to hear. There are a couple more things that I pulled out as uh, individual uh, statements or quotes really from you that, again, are just so incredibly powerful to share. Um, we'll let the, the, the audience read this from the screen, but Steve, any comments about kind of the, the uh, wellness of the network, as you mentioned already? Well, Adam, with what you see on the screen, it's just really easy to say I sleep at night. <laughs> um, you know, the reality is we don't have users having issues. And, and again, if you have a system where you're having all kinds of connectivity problems, you have a failed system. And we can't, have, we can't afford failure when it comes to med passes or when it comes to the ability to communicate with a doctor. Uh, it, it's just so vital to us to have this kind of result. And so... I think that's probably one of my proudest pieces of what my team's accomplished is, uh, you know, along with our ecosystem partners, is that we just don't have those kind of issues. Agreed, agreed. And as you said, 
in IT, we live to serve clinicians in this case. So I can't even imagine the type of uh, praise or accolade you must get from your teams based on this statement, that they're seeing an hour reduction in time per day, per, sh per nurse on documentation and coordination. I mean, any anecdotes to share of, of what you've heard from clinical teams? Yeah, this is huge. So we are a Studer hospital. We've been through the entire Studer process and, and getting the nurse to the, the bedside is absolutely critical to us. And so, you know, as we, as we really matured with patient safe and especially the comms piece with voice and text, we no longer are running back and forth to the nurse's station. We are doing a lot of stuff in the room. We collect all the vitals in the room. They do you know, different pieces of documentation. And so literally as we went out and just did some benchmark studies on what was happening, we could see that our nurses were in the room more. And, you know, we like to tell, I think like every hospital, Adam, we like to tell stories about our successes to the staff so they understand the impact they're having. And, you know, I could think of one situation in particular where uh, we had a patient who, very high profile individual in the community, very, very nervous about a pretty serious health condition. And the nurse went into the room and had the time to be with the patient and sat and held the patient's hand for a while and, and talked to him about the procedure they were going to undergo. And to this very day, that patient continues to contact us raving about the quality of the nursing care and the fact the nurse cared so much that she sat down with him. So, you know, to me, that's what we've been able to accomplish in part with this system. Wow. That is something. Um, you know, the goal, of course, is, is primarily, as you said, empowering the clinicians. But at the end of the day, we know that their goal is to provide better patient care. So it's so cool to hear of kind of that ripple effect from the uh, enhanced ability for the clinician, uh, you know, through their job. Well, again, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a, a really awesome conversation. Uh, we'll open it up just to Q&A. Uh, so for anyone on the line, feel free to submit your questions through the GoToWebinar platform. It looks like we have one coming in uh, right away, Steve. You had mentioned that perhaps there's some iPhone 10 in the future. I'm just curious, any thoughts of uh, why that device versus others from the Apple fleet? Well, yeah, absolutely, Adam. Uh, facial recognition is uh, just absolutely critical. One of the things that I struggle with is I think we all know the challenges we're having with cybersecurity. We, you know, I mean, I just read some stats from January, and it was just horrific how many breaches there have been and all those kind of problems. And so security is absolutely essential. But at the same time, taking a lesson from, like, the restaurant industry and others, we don't want the clinician to spend, an, you know, just an exorbitant amount of time just trying to log into their device. So I'm excited about the 10 and beyond because – I think that's really going to get us, as soon as we get it all certified with Patient Safe and everybody else, gives us a chance to even quicken more the ability of the nurse to, to appropriately authenticate into the system and be able to use their device. So uh, I think that's, you know, that, I think the footprint is pretty cool uh, on the 10 or even the 11. So uh, the 8s, you know, we did have the smaller one, but we have some of the bigger ones. And some nurses like that, but I think most prefer that little bit smaller footprint. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And, and totally agree with you from the Jamf side for what it's worth. Um, you know, Jamf Pro can set up the provisioning of a device whereby uh, all the typical setup screens in what is called iOS Setup Assistant are skipped, less the few default ones uh, connecting to a Wi-Fi network, selecting a language in a region. But in Jamf Pro, we could actually turn back on the requirement for the user to pair or set up Face ID. So the first time they are shipped their new device, they set up Face ID, and then they can use it to log into the phone or any app that would support it in the future. Uh, so would love to work together with you on that. Um, looks like there's another question coming in, uh, just kind of with the, the relevance of the cancellation of HIMSS, and of course, what's top of mind uh, regarding COVID-19. Any thoughts about how this technology may come into play at your organization uh, for any component of how you're responding? Well, one of the things, that's a great question. One of the, the, the plans we have is, I think like most all hospitals, we're looking at the number of negative pressure rooms we have. And, you know, should we get in a situation where we begin to, to have issues? Like everybody else, and we are certainly recommending that folks who are experiencing just normal flu symptoms stay home, quarantine themselves. But when we do see respiratory distress and some of the very things that the CDC guidelines provide, 
we're going to end up with those folks in our hospital and most likely in our, our uh, negative air rooms, our isolation rooms. So what we're going to do there is we're going to use a piece of software we have that will allow us to put an iPad in the room with the patient and then the doctor, the nurse, anybody that needs to through their iPhone or any other Apple device or for that matter even a PC will be able to communicate with the patient. And so, you know, we think this is going to be pretty important because one of our goals is certainly to care for the patient, but it's also to minimize the number of folks that are in and out of that room and potentially spreading, uh, you know, the, the virus. So uh, we're excited about that. We're, we, we're not excited to have anybody in this situation, but of if course. we do, uh, we're prepared to be able to communicate. Yeah, of course. H- hear you there. N- not to take advantage of situations by any means, but just, again, uh, uh, where we have technology that can provide benefit, why not leverage it? So, yeah, we've talked to a few other health systems, Steve, just over this last week about the same kind of use case for isolation rooms. And maybe apart from just the telemedicine component of it, why not give the patient a few apps for distraction or entertainment, education or something to that nature on that device, too? So food for thought. Oh, absolutely. That's a cool idea. Yeah, sure. Well, again, really appreciate you, Steve, and the rest of the audience joining us today. If you'd like to learn more specifically about PatientSafe, our partner, head over to jamf.it slash PatientSafe. You can download a brochure we put together kind of telling the Jamf and PatientSafe story. And, of course, if you'd like to learn more just about Jamf overall healthcare offerings, head over to jamf.com slash healthcare. Thanks so much, everybody, and hope you have a great rest of your day.